Visit Cross Goddesses by Katarzyna Tuchkova, translated by Andrew Oakland. A shared inheritance. She remembered the girls coming to Sulmina, mostly in the evening when the light was failing, so that even if seen, they wouldn't be recognised. They came shyly, but full of hope. Sormina would take them out into the dark, guided only by the flickering flame of an oil lamp, which Dora's gaze would follow from the window until it disappeared beyond the crest of the hill. Sormina always locked Dora and Jakobek in the cottage, so that Dora wouldn't think of going after her. Apparently, this was not something she should see. Her exclusion made Dora all the more curious and she never fell asleep until after the return of Sormina and the girl. And she never learned what the two had been doing out there. All she heard was the rustle of dried herbs being tipped into a bag, then words of thanks from the girl before she hurried out into the night. Then, Sormina made the mistake of forgetting to lock the door. She was lying wrapped in a woollen shawl next to the hot stove when a tapping on the cottage door roused her from her doze. She hastened to strain the herbal decoction that had been bubbling on the stove and to put her things into a cloth bag. Still in a mild state of confusion, she hurried into the night without having secured the door. Dora, wide awake as ever, went after her. Hidden by the darkness, but guided by the flickering light, Dora followed in Sormina's footsteps to the edge of the woods, where the spring rose into a well. Dora came close enough to see and hear what was going on. She saw a girl she recognised from Horetzenkov, squatting naked in a well, while over her Sormina poured the brew now mixed with spring water. I wash you with five fingers, with a palm as the six, so that the chosen one will come to you, to make you most precious to him, the dearest of all virgins, so that he cannot eat, cannot drink, cannot sleep, cannot smoke tobacco, cannot make merry, can come only towards this Hanichka, until he reaches her and enters into marriage with her. Sormina bent down to the well and then straightened up again, making sure that Hanichka was thoroughly wet. She washed her hair and rubbed her arms and legs. So that for him, an hour is not an hour. Family is not family. A sister is not a sister. A brother is not a brother. A mother is not a mother. A father is not a father. So that nothing is dearer to him than his chosen one. With God's help, let her be placed before his eyes. Hanichka began to pray. Thus I perform this enchantment, Sulmina continued, as she moved around the well, and over it made the sign of a large cross. When she had finished, she wrapped the girl in a canvas grass carrier that she had brought in her linen sack for this purpose. When she had dried the girl, and the girl was dressing, she asked, When will you have your monthly bleeding? In a week, said Tanichka, her voice shy and faltering. I see. On the very first day, add to the yeast three drops of your blood collected from the cloth, and one hair from your pubis, and leave the dough to rise. After baking, take all the prettiest cakes, and hold them for a short time in your armpit. A few minutes should be enough while they're still warm, but not while they're hot so you don't scald yourself. Put them on a plate. When young Liptark is passing, offer them to him, telling him to take a few if he likes the taste of them. Not so many know that he'll share them out. He must eat them himself, as you know. As she put on her blouse and skirt, Hanichka hung on every word Sormina was saying. 
and she nodded again and again. She didn't want to get this wrong. When we get home, I'll give you some John's wort and brown pine and amaranth for you to wear so you'll smell sweet. To him in particular. Hinichika laughed with delight and then sang a Kopenyetsa song in a low voice. How you boys do not know why you run around me so, for I'm wearing ground pine attached to this fine pinny of mine. That's right, said Sormina, nodding. The light of the paraffin lamp over the well illuminated only the stage on which this scene was played out, together with its two actors. Dora was wrapped with wonder. Some months later, Dora again looked on incredulous as Hanichka, in a wedding dress, with a great crown of flowers in her hair, was led to the altar at Orichinkov by one of the Liptak boys. Was she imagining things? Or was Sormina and Hanichka exchanging special smiles? Taming the Storm As Dora advanced slowly up the hill, she saw Yukovek waving wildly at her. His knees were pulled up to his chin and held there by the embrace of the arm that wasn't waving. Dora waved back and quickened her pace, powered by the wind at her back. A storm was brewing. Although it was still afternoon, Zhitkova was cloaked in gloom. The first drops of rain were due any time now. <coughs> hey, he said to her by way of greeting, when at last she was standing in the little garden in front of the house. Jakobek motioned with his chin towards her and cough. Dora turned and saw that what he had been watching so intently was not her approach, but the endless jumble of storm clouds rolling slowly towards them. Like a living mass, like an uncontrollable beast capable of destroying everything in its way in a moment. The heavy clouds twisted and poured into one another. And the beast's path was all the fields on their side of the hills of Zhitkova. The Bedova, the Kopavazi, the Hudaki, the Rovna, the Cherna. Dora looked to the hillside that rose above the cottage. Right in the middle of the steep slope stood a small woman, bolt upright, looking as though she would be pitched over and sent tumbling downwards at any moment. To get a better view, Dora walked up from the shed and screwed up her eyes. To her astonishment, she saw with certainty that the woman was Somina, struggling to keep her balance as she braced herself against the wind. Without a second thought, Dora set off towards her. What was Sumina doing, standing with her arms raised to the coming storm, waiting to be whipped by the first torrents of rain? Had she gone mad? Dora clambered up the steep hillside, tearing at the grass to quicken her progress. Auntie, she yelled. But from her position on high, Sumina did not see her. All her attention was directed at Horetzenkov and the eye of the dark element. Impelled onwards by the gust at her back, Dora accelerated, concentrating all her energies on the task at hand. There was no doubt that a storm was on its way. When Dora was close enough to read Sormina's expression, she was shocked by the ferocity she read in it. This was new to her. Auntie! She called again. No reaction. Instead of looking in Dora's direction, Sormina raised her arms slowly, as though wishing to embrace the devastating power that would soon be upon them. At the same moment, she started to mutter, but the wind took the words from her mouth, so that Dora heard nothing of what was said. Dora took a few steps more, before the wind took hold of her, turned her around, then caught her by surprise by rushing at her from the front. Startled, she landed on the ground, 
suddenly aware of how powerless she was to prevent her body from scraping against rocks and thorns, or being thrown against the trunk of one of their limes on the door of the cow shed. Again, she fixed her gaze on Somina as her hands clawed at the grass. Somina looked like she was dancing. Apparently she had become so used to the wind that she was no longer struggling to keep her balance. As her arms embraced the wind, her hips swayed in wide circular motions. At the beginning of each motion, she clenched her fists as though trapping a gust. Then she made a sweeping movement to send it back the way it had come. The grass around Sormina began to undulate in a semicircle her gesture was describing. Evidently, the wind was turning around her. Suddenly, Dora heard snippets of words carried by the reverse current. But she did not understand these words. Encrypted in a song she was hearing for the first time, they were worshipping someone she did not know. Oppose the storm, Heavenly Father, Almighty God. Oppose the storm, His beloved Son. Oppose the storm, Holy Ghost, Hagios, Othios, Ishiros, Holy, 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 Lord God of heavenly hosts. Heaven and earth are filled with thy majesty and thy glory. Staring up at Sormina in disbelief, Thora strained to make out her aunt's words. Now with a sweeping top to bottom, left to right gesture, Sormina was making the sign of the cross. The incantation continued. Banish these turbid clouds and this violent air with all their harmful vices their hail, their thunder, and their lightning. We beseech you, God Almighty, to dispel and despoil them. The wind performed somersaults across the hillside, carrying away clumps of soil and dry grass and tearing the heads from meadow flowers. Dora's eyes and mouth were full of dust. I enchant ye in the name of the Day of Judgment, in the name of God Almighty, conqueror of all evil, that ye turn your hell from these crops and gardens to the hills, the rocks and the water, where no one sows, plants or grafts. At this point, Dora was struck by a gust so strong that the tufts of grass came away in her hands and she was propelled 20 feet down the slope. Her vision dimmed and she cried out in terror. The wind was tossing her about like a sheaf of hay. She was quite helpless. This was surely her end. Her slide was halted by a rock. Pain brought tears to her eyes. Help! She yelled into the wind. Help! But Selmina did not move. And far and wide, there was no one else who could help her. Dora clung desperately to the rock, her shoulders around her ears, as she attempted to hide from the gale, from the flying grass and twigs that whipped her face, from her fear. In her helplessness, she started to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, she gasped on the verge of tears. She went on with her prayer, even as her mouth filled with dust, even though the coughing this brought on, on earth as it is in heaven. The dusty vortex passed over her head, and still the words flowed from her mouth, at first quietly, then louder, until she was shouting for all she was worth and quite beside herself. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Then the wind swirled up one more time, lost, and then gained strength turned swiftly against itself, gave one final blast, quietened, and then fell silent. In the new calm, Dora's and Sormina's voices merged as one. Deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
it was over. As if by magic, the gale had vanished. Dora sat up and looked about in confusion. She saw that the clouds were in retreat, that their heaving, menacing blackness was rolling towards the uninhabited woods of Kikula Hill, beyond Horetzenkov and away from Zhidkova. She was at a loss about what to make of all this. Come on, get up. Sulmina was bending over her and sighing. She took Dora by the arm and helped her to her feet. Sulmina's hand was shaking. When Dora turned to look into her face, she saw that it was drawn with fatigue. Each leaning on the other, slowly they made their way down the hill. Baglaka was standing by the cowshed, waving with delight. Jakobek was racing about and yelling, You did it, Sulmina, you did it! You drove the storm away! This time, I got some help from her, Sulmina wheezed, glancing at Dora. Thank you, Sarah. With the first half behind us, we are now nearer to the first story of the second half than the first story of the first 